Good morning. I'm Bonnie Gardner. I'm co-chair of the Public Affairs Forum of the First Unitarian Universalist Church of Austin. Welcome. Our forums are free and open to the public and are scheduled on most Sundays at noon. For more information about our programs, you can go to our church website at www.austinuu.org. And we're located at 4700 Grover Avenue. Today, I am honored to introduce Matt Simpson, who is the Senior Policy Strategist at the ACLU of Texas. He's been advocating in the Texas legislature for criminal justice and juvenile justice reforms. He also works with a large cross-section of other coalition partners to ensure the rights of immigrants. And in addition to his legislative advocacy, Matt works with organizers and local members on various local campaigns, such as the Austin area community groups, the Austin Police Department, as they begin to use body cameras. He's going to be talking about why everyone should care about prisons in Texas, um, their costliness, their ineffectiveness, and perhaps cruelty some of the time, and perhaps... Uh, why Texas should raise the age of adult criminal responsibility from 17 to 18, and why extreme criminal penalties don't make us any safer at all. Uh, very expensive for capital punishment, for example. It's not a deterrent. And why diverse voices from across the political landscape are now calling for reforms. It's a big national movement. So, Matt, come on up and inform us, please. Give him a warm welcome. Well, thank you very much. Um, so I think a good place to start is um, with kind of the, the, the history. I, I want to talk about a few different um, areas of criminal justice, I guess you'd say reform, kind of trends in criminal justice that have really emerged in the past few years and have really made it into the mainstream conversation for the first time, um, you know, may, maybe in, in our history. Um, and so the few things I want to talk about, and I'll, you know, I'll go into more depth with each of these, but I want to talk about prisons and overcrowding. Um, I want to talk about Black Lives Matters and police accountability. Uh, and, and I want to talk a little bit about technology and the way that technology has changed, both policing and police accountability. Um, so I'm going to start with um, some of the trends we're seeing in, in the use of prisons and really the criminal justice system in general. Um, what we have today is uh, about... 150,000 people are incarcerated in state prisons across the state, and another 75,000 to 80,000 are incarcerated in jails run by counties. Um, another half a million people, roughly, are on probation or parole or on paper on some form. Uh, this is a huge percentage of the people. There's only 25 million people in Texas, and nearly 1 million are involved with the criminal justice system actively. Uh, this is the same across the country. That you know, Nationally, we see the same trends. It, prisons have grown. Um, it, really, if you look at the chart, public safety and crime has gone down. Public safety has, I guess, technically gone up, but crime, particularly serious crime, has gone down, while our prison population has gone up. Texas is sort of a unique uh, example, though. You know, given how bad some of those stats are, um, we have actually leveled off, and we haven't grown our, particularly our prison population, in about 10 years. Um, so I'm going to, I guess, we'll start from the beginning, and we can talk about how we got to a large population and then how it leveled off, because they're both interesting and useful to think about here. Uh, Ann Richards was uh, a governor, obviously, many of you are familiar with Ann Richards. Um, and, and Ann Richards actually had kind of a hard on crime mentality. Uh, she oversaw an expansion of the prison system in the state that was much larger than, than her predecessors. Um, this kind of set Texas on a, on a, in motion to have a lot of people incarcerated in our prisons. Um, the state jail system was another uh, – we, we created a class of felony that was sort of in between misdemeanor and felony, so kind of a, in between the most serious kind of crime versus more like the less serious kinds of crime. Uh, and that added to the number of people in our prison system. So starting in the 80s through the 90s, we really saw um, kind of a, you know, tough on crime, let's lock them away. Um, thankfully, we never went down the road that California went with the three strikes law, so – in California, if you have three offenses, that can be life in prison. 
Uh, Texas thankfully never had that kind of a mandatory minimum uh, policy in place because I think we would have a much more of a crisis at this point. Um, but we did have a growing and, and ever expanding uh, prison population. So in about 2007, legislators looked up uh, and, and said, you know, 2005, 2007, uh, Jerry Madden from Plano and uh, Senator Whitmire from Houston and, and many others looked up and said, um, you know, we're starting to spend a whole lot of money building prisons, maintaining prisons. I mean, there's 120 facilities run by the state that are prisons or similar to prisons. And, uh, and so that, that spending kind of paired with, like, well, what are we getting for it? You know, and, and I think it's a fair question to ask that. Uh, really, really pushed the legislature to, to rethink how we use prisons for, you know, the first time since, you know, we had kind of started on this foray. And so in 2007, there were a bunch of uh, basically budget maneuvers. Um, a lot of money was shifted over to increase diversion at the local level so we'd have fewer people finally ending up in the state prison system. Those reforms have been followed by a series of reforms each session. Our legislature meets every two years, as you know, and and so, we, you know, each session there's a additional, you know, minor tweaks to the system here and there. But ultimately, we've seen since 2007 that the, the legislature, the, the, I'm sorry, the number of prisons, the, the population of our prisons has remained the same. It's about 150,000 today, uh, as it was in 2007. And so people across the country look at Texas. I mean, Texas is an interesting case study, I mean, for people that think, see these things in a national or international context. Um, it was a get, you know, tough on crime state for a while. And then in 2007, there was this change of, of, of approach, but it's uh, leveled off rather than reduced the number of people. I mean, you take this, um, you know, it, it compared to some other states that have made much larger cuts. I mean, California was obviously forced to find a way to reduce their population in their, in their prisons. Um, and they did it by releasing a lot of people, you know. Um, Texas is probably on the path to find a way to ensure that m more people don't go to prison to begin with rather than releasing people. Um, and and to, in a lot of ways, that's the more sustainable approach. So as Senator Whitmire will often say, where we're at now is we want to lock up people we're afraid of and not use jails and prisons for people we're mad at. Uh, I don't know that I would necessarily say it that way, but I think that the idea that we need to target the use of, of facilities like prisons for very extreme behavior. And so kind of this has all started to, to both as it's happened in Texas, it's also just kind of started to raise, you know, um, pe pe people across the country are starting to, to kind of be aware that there are a lot of people in prison. You know, Orange is the New Black has raised a lot of awareness, and, and there's a lot of other, you know, kind of mainstream instances where the criminal justice system is, you know, really starting, people are starting to be aware of it. The other thing I think that's happening, and, you know, is that there is an awareness that, you know, there's just this dramatic disproportionality, right? I mean, African Americans are much more impacted by both policing and, and prisons and jails than, than their white counterparts. And, um, and so that, that awareness, you know, in a way, you sort of have mainstream America realizing that, you know, oh, well, this has been really unjust for a long time. And frankly, a lot of African Americans have known that, and, and we should have been listening. Um, I, I think, you know, there, so the, the future is going to be kind of interesting in Texas. You know, I think that, we'll, you know, there's going to be different voices. I mean, some of the voices that, that are interested in re these reforms are literally, you know, uh, groups funded by the Koch brothers, right? I mean, there's groups like Texas Public Policy Foundation that really want to see fewer people in state prisons that I think, you know, they're true fiscal conservatives, and, they're, and they have a different perspective, I think, than, than well, I certainly do personally, I guess, in, in terms of some of the approaches to government. But, I mean, on this point, um, you know, the money alone doesn't make sense, much less the suffering that we inflict on individuals. So you, you start to have, um, and, you know, in Texas, the ACLU works with the Texas Association of Business, which is basically the chambers of commerce of the state have an association, uh, the Texas Public Policy Foundation, the, you know, Grover Norquist Fiscal Conservatives, Goodwill Industries, who works a great deal in direct services for people that are coming back from prison to our communities, um, and, and some other, you know, other criminal justice reform groups, the Texas Criminal Justice Coalition and other groups like that. Those groups have come together, and they provide sort of an interesting voice to legislators. You know, this reform, this reduction in the prison population starting in 2007 and moving forward has been, you know, if you read about it, it's very much led by legislators in some ways. They're certainly the face of the, of the policy reforms, but um, sort of in the background, you've had these voices all along, and now we're starting to see not just, you know, the ACLU and other people that are perceived as just being like liberal activists, essentially, you know, you're starting to hear these new voices, like business. Business doesn't want to incarcerate people. Well, you know, they're 
when they come and talk, like, it really, in so many ways, you know, what you need is, is narratives that everybody can understand or, or messages that people – that make sense to basically the array of kind of uh, political and philosophical approaches to this stuff. So you have TPPF. They can walk into the room and they can say, look, we're wasting a lot of money because we, have redu we, we are seeing reductions in crime right now, and yet we continue to try to incarcerate all these people. There's no evidence that this is working. And in fact, um, you know, uh, uh, Professor Spellman from UT, um, who's also on, on city council, some of you may remember him from his time on city council, did, did a paper in about 2005 on, on Texas people in Texas prisons that showed that somewhere between five and eight years in a state prison, a person's recidivism rate starts going up instead of going down. So, you know, you start to see numbers like that, and even fiscal conservatives and others can say, look, I mean, this is simple math. If you have to incarcerate somebody twice for seven years instead of incarcerating them once for five and they're on probation or however you would work it, uh, you know, it's pretty easy to see where there's some savings. And if you can't, you have to, you know, the recidivism rates are a good indicator of whether you're impacting public safety. You know, if someone commits another crime, you know, that then you may not have failed in, in intervening appropriately there. So recidivism rates really indicate that approaches other than the ones we've gone at, particularly lengthy sentences. Lengthy sentences do not seem to be the way to address recidivism rates. They don't seem to keep people from committing new crimes. Texas Public Policy Foundation can walk in and say it doesn't make, mo it doesn't make sense to spend money on long sentences because we're not getting a public safety thing for our buck. The, the business folks can come in and, and they can talk about the way that they have a hard time employing people if they have a felony on, the, on their record. And so you want to reserve the, the scarlet letter of the felony for people that have truly done something that we should be fearful of. Um, and, and maybe we need to just come up with a better way of thinking about it. I mean, again, you know, research is, is starting to really run against many of the assumptions people have. Um, basically, someone who is there's – a, there's a zone or an age between about 18 and 30 where almost every crime is committed, you know. And so people very often age out of this uh, age where, you know, you're just demographically speaking. Um, they're just more likely to commit crimes. And so – very often our sentencing don't, doesn't even take into account these basic uh, demographic facts that, that people that commit crime are in a certain age group, and they t do tend to age out. I mean, it's a sociological, demonstrable fact. Um, and so, you know, you have folks like the Chamber of Commerce that can say, look, you know, we, we, we might have been worried about somebody when they had just committed this crime, but, you know, if it's been 25 years, they've been completely, you know, out of, out of the system – Maybe they would make a good employee, and it's really inefficient, you know, to have them not be able to be employed. And, um, you know, sometimes there's uh, – people can't – you know, have, they don't have driver's licenses because of various uh, penalties as well. And so, you know, you have all these ways that, that the Chamber of Commerce is concerned that we're making part of our workforce not, you know, not able to be fully functioning. Um, and then, you know, ACLU and, and other groups obviously talk about – you know, we don't just talk about the constitutional rights and the civil liberties of, of prisoners, although it's a real question. TDCJ right now is being sued about their um, in, in lack of air conditioning. So many people don't know this, but virtually every single prison, uh, you know, like 116 of the 130-ish, 120-ish, a large number of them do not have air conditioning. And many of them are in parts of the state that get very hot and or very cold. Um, so, I mean, this, this is something the state is going to have to spend a fortune on eventually once the state either gets sued or decides that they want to avoid being sued. Um, and so these are the kinds of things that come up for so the ACLU can, and, and others can talk about this. We come into the room and we say, well, mass incarceration, overuse of the prison system is a problem because look at what's happening because we've, uh, we're over capacity and we don't have the money and the resources to really individually sit down with people, find a way to try to work with them. What are the life skills they need? What do we do to avoid them returning to, uh, you know, patterns of drug use? We don't have time for that. We just stick them in an unair conditioned facility where nobody has anything to do with them, and then we just hope that when they come out to our community, somebody like Goodwill can step in and really save the day. We need fewer people in prison, from my perspective, so that we can do more of that work with people so that when they come out of our prison system, they're not coming out more likely to recidivate. They should be coming out with life skills, with the way to, to be employed and to find housing. I mean, if you talk to anybody, uh, you know, um, v Victor and I work with some folks that are that are, have returned from being incarcerated, and you know, they they can't find housing. Like, there's nowhere to live. You know, you, no one. There's a uniform policy with any property owned by a pro property manager. No property manager allows anybody with a felony ever to live in their property, and so you, then you have to search 
for individual property owners that are willing to rent to somebody with a felony in their background. It's very easy to understand how these challenges drive people back into the, the patterns of recidivism and other issues. So the final kind of voice that we're seeing at the legislature, and really hoping we can get over this hump, we want to go from flatline to reduction, is Goodwill. And they're the, they're the Goodwill Incorporated here in Austin um, and across the state, works with folks who are reentering. They have literacy classes. They have, you know, life skills, employment programs. And so they can really come into the room. They can talk to legislators or even just community leaders and, and say, you know, we can, we can do better than this. We've seen people, individuals succeed. They can bring individuals. We have, we've had these um, folks that have succeeded after returning from prison come and speak at the Capitol at, at press conferences. So I think, I think that it, this is really exciting. And I get this feeling um, that in a lot of ways, you know, we're hearing on CNN and Fox and everything that there's this, oh, man, there's, there's so many people in, in prison. Um, but what we're not hearing about are these interesting coalitions that are forming of people that have come at this from very different perspectives and all agree and all kind of pushing in the same direction. And so, um, you know, I, I think I'll move on from this subject. But, I, the, you know, I just think it's been um, an interesting 10 years. Uh, and I think that it's something that folks should really start paying attention to. I think we'll hear more and more about this. Um, you know, some of the Black Lives Matter um, things that have seeped into the, then the, the presidential election, um, you know, all this has really raised consciousness about our criminal justice system. I'm hopeful that here in Texas we can really, um, you know, kind of capitalize on the momentum in some ways of stalling out the prison population and, and trying to move to reducing it. Uh, so kind of the second area of reform that I think is happening kind of under our noses here in Texas is there's a real push to make sure those with mental health issues, the mentally ill, are not criminalized based basically on either, um, you know, some kind of having a mental health crisis in public and law enforcement coming and picking somebody up, or there are a large number of people um, that have untreated mental health needs that have what's called a co-occurring um, morbidity or, or co-occurring drug use and mental health issues. And so um, what we see is with, you know, kind of our unfortunate, kind of our longstanding war on drugs some of the policies have done a bad job kind of differentiating from folks, you know, folks that are like, you know, drug dealers or something versus people that are really um, can be identified by mental health experts as having predominantly some kind of mental health disorder and then also have, having some co-occurring drug or alcohol use problem. Um, and so what we're seeing is that there's become really uniform support in terms of the legislature, and, and I think it's among a lot of communities as well, that we should be diverting folks with mental health issues. If you're, if it's mental health issue first, and then you end up with like a disturbing the peace ticket that you land in jail for, and then you lose your job, and then you um, you can't, you know, you, then you end up in jail to pay off the ticket. Those kinds of scenarios are really counterproductive. And a lot of different communities have started approaching this differently, but it's been really interesting to watch. I'll give you quickly kind of three different models we've seen, and they're all kind of have their own interesting merits. And I think you know in a time not too long from now, we'll probably start seeing all these kind of use strategies used together. Um, one is in Houston. Uh, they have special, um, basically, uh, police cruisers or special cars. They have about 40 of these units, and it's a professional, like, law enforcement police officer from HPD, uh, paired with a mental health professional who has been trained in kind of um, how to work with police, basically. And so they're, they go out and they do um, what's called crisis intervention. And so uh, if somebody calls 911 and they say, you know, there's somebody that seems to be having a mental health crisis, they're, you know, maybe they're out in their front yard making a lot of noise, let's say. Um, if if the person operating 911 can can kind of figure out that this is a mental health crisis, they have the option to send out these specialty units. And so then, you know, the specialty units, they, they've been keeping track of their savings, and it's actually astronomical. But it, everybody that they avoid taking to jail you know, not only is it obviously better for that individual and a more appropriate and moral way to treat somebody, but it's also a huge savings to the city. I mean, they've, they've diverted a lot of people out of the county jail that used to be there before. It's an interesting program. Um, you know, the idea of pairing somebody that's an expert with, in mental health matters with somebody that's a, a police officer, you hope, you hope that everybody can, um, can really build trust, and that can be um, a skill sharing. Because, I mean, I think that it is something that, that you know, I, I, Quite frankly, it's a common community complaint about law enforcement that they mishandle situations like mental health crises. Uh, so this is a very interesting way to get ahead of that. It also has diverted, diverted people out of the jail. Um, an another example is uh, Bryan College Station. Bryan, um, 
Brazos County runs the jail there. Brazos County has paired with the local mental health authority, the MHMR, and um, they have officers that are basically assigned to work as conduits between the mental health services and the jail. So if someone does get arrested, um, they're basically able to transfer them out of there. If it's, uh, you know, a lot of people with mental health issues, this may not be common knowledge, a lot of people with mental health issues in larger cities particularly get arrested for trespass or other things that, you know, are kind of minor um, disturbances because they're, um, you know, sometimes law enforcement is just looking for an opportunity to move them away from wherever they are, or, you know, and there's kind of these, um, it, it's not the kind of incentives we, I think we wish that we had. We wish that there was an incentive to move them into, you know, if someone is having a mental health crisis, the, the goal should be to get them to services. And so it's kind of a shame that that's not always how it works. But um, but in Brazos, they've done a good job. And it's it's a much smaller community than Houston. So it's been very interesting. Their their version is far more informal. It was kind of like a, uh, you know, somebody at the jail calls up the LMA chain. It's like, hey, it happened again. We got Bill, you know. And so, um, and that, that but that model works. And I liked it particularly, we, we toured their jail, and I liked that it was tied to, uh, kind of local needs, you know. They, I thought that it was interesting they built it around that. Um, here in Austin, um, there's a, uh, a the focus is really almost completely pre any criminal justice involvement. And, and I'll tell you off the top, this is my favorite model. I think that in in a lot of like you know kind of philosophical like moral and ethical ways, it's actually pretty inappropriate for us as a society to criminalize mental health, right? So maybe it's it makes a lot of sense to get out ahead of the criminal justice system. So uh, what we have in here is a sort of a hybrid of the Houston model where we have mental health professionals that work with people that are basically at high risk of being involved with the criminal justice system. But they're very often more engaged in just making sure folks are taking their medications or going to see their counselors or whatever else. And so um, there's sort of a high risk population that's identified before they hit the jail, I guess I would say. Um, also a really good model. So these are all things that, you know, I think the statewide, from the statewide perspective, you know, um, Academics and, and the and the think tanks that work on mental health issues and criminal justice issues and legislators and the governor. I think people are starting to see. Oh, you know, there, there's a way that makes a lot more sense. Uh, a jail is a horrible setting to get, to provide mental health services, um, and so there's there's a lot of options here. As long as somebody hasn't committed a crime that is um, really dramatic, if somebody's committed a crime that's minor, like you know, possession of a drug or a trespass or those kinds of things, if it's not a lot of drugs, you know what. Wouldn't it be better to try to divert them? Um, and so it's been interesting. This is a conversation that we'll, I, I imagine we'll be hearing a lot more about as we move forward. The final uh, item I wanted to chat about is, <clears throat> is, is the uh, state's effort to create a uniform law on police body cameras and then kind of what's happening here in, in Austin. So, um, you know, one of the kind of technological measures that's been rolled out to um, – kind of increase police accountability is that officers now in some places are wearing actual cameras on them. And it's sort of an extension of the of the video, the dash cam uh, cars, you know, a lot of cars now have, have video uh, capacity. And so now we're going to attach it to the individual officer. Um, you know, so I'm from the ACLU, so let's get the privacy aspects out of the way first. Um, you know, obviously there's some major privacy concerns. It's pretty different, uh, you know, I always kind of get these funny visual images, but, you know, you don't drive a car, a cruiser into someone's home, whereas officers are investigating things inside people's homes, you know, enough that it's happening. And um, and so you have, so it was a real struggle. We, we the ACLU and the NAACP and a couple of other advocacy groups were, um, were literally on the working group for this statewide legislation on, on, um, it, on body-worn cameras. And, you know, it was a real, it, I think I was, A, I was very impressed. Everybody in the room, law enforcement and everybody else, was really committed to figuring out how to balance privacy versus basically the, the right to, to see video of law enforcement. Um, you know, I, I think that the, the law ended up being protective. But I, in many ways, I think that that might have been – I think that we missed the boat a little bit, too, on the privacy. And this is how. There's no provision in the bill that – a lot that really dictates that a police department redact like an individual space and then release a video uh, that's sensitive. So, in my opinion, and when there's a small, uh, when there when there's a, there's a, probably a small number of videos that would be coming from body worn cameras, kind of like we've seen with. I mean, we have a lot of experience with dash cameras, so I think we can kind of draw parallels. When it comes to the the video, we really are going to want to see as a society to ensure police accountability. Uh, it's the officer-involved shootings. It's the major misconduct complaints. It's the, um, you know, when, when something went really wrong and we as the public want to know. 
and, and I think that we um, here in Austin and, and at the state level in 2017, we really uh, are going to have to work to, to push the to, to, to shape the law so that those videos are releasable. Um, as it stands, um, let's if an officer were to say shoot someone within a private residence, it might be impossible, if not very difficult, to get that video and have it released. And I just think the body cameras are an opportunity to build trust between law enforcement and the community. And I think we need to do everything we can, both at the state legislature and really here in Austin, to ensure that if videos of something pretty dramatic are, are out there, they're, they're released. And maybe, again, maybe we need to go back and really think about, are there instances where law enforcement should be required to redact the civilians, essentially, and just show what happened with law enforcement officers there? One thing that is happening in Austin is that, so the, um, the bill passed and it provided a framework for local people to enact the body cameras, but there was a lot of leeway given to local police departments. I mean, it makes a lot of sense. Different police departments do things differently. So Austin's rolling out. Uh, they've just recently requested uh, someone. They're, they're trying to find a, a contractor to provide this technology and the storage of the video. Uh, and they're planning on rolling it out first with the officers downtown, kind of in the 6th Street area, and then they'll roll it out to other areas as well. And so now, like now and over the next three or four months, maybe maybe six months, uh, you know, the city of Austin will be developing all the policies and, and APD will be developing all the policies. Um, I think it's a really great opportunity to uh, look for ways to work within the, con the, the law, the state law, and ensure there's um, this video is available. And, and one of the ways I think that, you know, just, just – for example, uh, APD has a lot of discretion to release videos on, for a law enforcement purpose. And I, I think it's a completely legitimate law enforcement purpose to release video to build trust with the community, to provide an accountability measure for, for individuals in the community. So those are the kinds of things I think that we'll see in the next couple of months. Austin, as we go through what the body cameras, uh, how they're going to be handled, um, I think those are the kinds of questions that we'll start to see folks wrestling with. Um, so I think I'll just stop there. I think I'm pretty close to the time for the, the Q&A. Is that right? Okay, great. Yeah. Thank you, Matt. Very informative. Yep. And, and I, I just want to underscore, underscore that uh, he's absolutely right that over 30% of the population in our county jail has have significant mental health and substance abuse problems. And so our local jail has become our de facto psychiatric facility and there's increasing pressure on public officials to determine why that is and what are some better alternatives and I certainly hope that you are consulting with our local officials uh, in some kind of organized effort to improve this situation. So who has a question? Okay, Douglas. Thank you for an excellent presentation. Um, I've been a supporter of the ACLU for a long time. We thank you. You made one comment that businesses don't want to incarcerate people, but I'd like you to comment on an exception, which is the private prison community. Sure. And, uh, you know, what is your interaction with that group? Well, yeah, it's interesting. I think, you know, this is um, – and you know, I think I um, – I've become quite the Texas exceptionalist. I think our, all our issues are unique, and no one's ever seen anything like it before. So this is one that I, I think of like that too. I, I have to say, I think in Texas we have we have not seen private uh, non-immigration facilities really work. Um, like Waco's got a, a, a private facility; they run parallel to their public jail, and it doesn't. They're all, it's always a problem. They're always talking about shutting it down. It doesn't work right. Nobody wants to work there. Um, and so, you know, I would say in, in terms of the, the state prison system doesn't seem interested. We closed two private facility, one private facility in 2013. So, I mean, we're, we're moving away from that at, at the state level. At the local level, it hasn't, take, hasn't been interested. It hasn't take, taken root, really. The, the exact opposite is true when it comes to immigration detention. I mean, basically, you know, throughout Texas, we have all these immigration facilities that are run by a private contractor and, quite frankly, uh, have dramatic problems. We, uh, ACLU put out a report um, called warehoused and forgotten uh, on a lot of these facilities, and they have dramatic problems. I mean, I you know, so sort of sidestepping your question, but you know, I mean, I you know, I, I tend to work more at the state and local level, and we've been very lucky to sort of have missed this. Um, but I will say, at the federal level, uh, the federal facilities in Texas, I mean, it's um, 
It really, I mean, it, it, it really raises the question just fundamentally, should we be allowing anybody to profit off of a prison? I mean, I, you know, it may, maybe we should just go back to the basics here. I mean, I, I could go into, like, the various allegations of misconduct there, but I think, you know, maybe it's just not working right to do that. That approach might not be a good one. So. We have a question from Jim Bryce. And raise your hands high so I can know who's close by and next. Yeah, n not to mention bankrupting uh, cities who issue municipal bonds on that. That's right. Uh, <clears throat> I'm fascinated and appreciate the work of ACLU and, and you in this area because I go back about uh, literally 50 years. It scares me to realize that yeah. uh, in working in criminal justice in this area. Oh, great. Uh, uh, starting with the uh, National Council on Crime and Delinquency that forecast a lot of these. One of the big issues uh, that I think, and you touched on it, but I, I really want to emphasize, uh, is diversion. I have the privilege of working with Adrian Moore, whom I worked in NCCD with. Uh, we formed an organization called the Council on At-Risk Youth to recognize children getting involved in these problems early on and divert them from the system. But that diversion, and the, at whatever age, and the alternatives of providing really good supervision in probation and parole for those and parole for those who have been in, locked up mm -hmm. is dramatically more effective and dramatically less expensive. Mm -hmm. The problem we run into over all these decades is getting those in positions with the money and power to make a change to move from the punitive idea and the idea that locking people up and restraining them is going to slow it down. What I'm asking is how can you improve diversion and especially get the mindset of the policymakers and the people who have the purse strings to make this happen. Thank you. Well, I mean, that's the $64,000 question in a lot of ways. But, um, I, you know, I think it, what, uh, you know, it's a combination, as far as I can tell, there's the, the research, they're the experts. Um, there are people that I think more and more, you know, <laughs> I, I was trying to avoid sports metaphors, but it always happens. Uh, so uh, you all may be familiar with the movie, the Brad Pitt movie, Moneyball, you know, that, or at least the concept. The Oakland A's started using analytics, and they kind of were able to put together a team more cheaply and were very successful. And I, I think there's a metaphor there for criminal justice work, right? The, 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 the research over the years has showed us that we're doing things wrong, and we need to change our approaches. And so – that's sort of unassailable, you know, like it doesn't really matter if you are conservative or, or liberal or, or anything else, you know, if, if you just say, look, we're locking a bunch of kids up and they come out and it doesn't work right, it doesn't work the way we want it to, that's starting to be the reality, right, and people are starting to realize it. And so that's where I think then you have kind of that second wave of folks talking like the, the, the Chamber of Commerce people and the right on crime folks, you know. One of the problems we've had in the state is that you kind of had this perception that these reforms were a liberal agenda item. and. You know, I think that that's been completely dispelled at this point. So, um, you know, I think those have been the pieces we've figured out so far. It's kind of a, it's an ongoing puzzle to figure out. I think part of it is, is really, you know, we, this is a, a classic, you know, the criminal justice policy folks, it's the perception of how safe you are versus the reality of how much, what the crime rates are, are never tied to each other. So public opinion just shifts unrelated to the actual amount of crime. And so even just figuring out a way to have a conversation where we start having people, the public, understand how where crime is even at um, would be a big turning. Uh, uh, you know, I think it would change the way voters act. So there are a lot of answers. I don't know if I have any one. I'm sure you have a few thoughts on this if you've been doing it as long as you have. So We have a question from Norman Allen. Norman? Has there been any studies done on the uh, social status, uh, racial relations, and rate of incarcerate, incarceration. And two, what do you think about community policing and how is our, our police uh, forces trained to handle community issues from a social services perspective? Yeah, well, great, both great questions. Um, so I think the, you know, when maybe I'll start with the, the community policing question. So. Um, you, you know, I think that we've seen um, real failures across the United States in terms of community policing. I mean, I think that that's part of what we're hearing, and, and that's part of why there's demonstrations in, in Baltimore and St. Louis, everywhere else in Ferguson. 
so yeah, I mean, I think I think we're still a long way from getting to the goal of community policing, but I I do think that there's something to it. You know, everybody. I think what's been surprising to me is like it's one of those areas where people agree. You know, um, law enforcement understands that it's it's part of their job to be able to have people feel comfortable reporting crimes to them, um, and and regular people want to be able to report crimes to an officer without feeling like that officer's going to throw them in jail instead or whatever you know whatever the fear is, and so. Um, you know, we, we sort of go through, there's, there's different ways that there are problems with this. You know, it's, it's, a, it's a, community policing is kind of undermined by a few things. You have uh, local law enforcement that wants to do immigration enforcement, very often undermines community policing. It means that you have a sector of the, of the community that is uncomfortable calling law, law enforcement. Um, because, I mean, we all, you know, it's not only are there people that are undocumented that live in Austin, but there are also people that are, you know, documented that have a, an aunt that lives with them temporarily that's undocumented. I mean, it impacts more people than I think we realize. Um, and then you also have issues like, you know, I think, um, you know, we saw in, in, in the Dallas area about five, five to ten years ago, I mean, um, Arab people and Muslim people were really scared to call law enforcement because they had been targeted in, in terms of being monitored at their mosques. So there are these police practices. And then obviously, I mean, that doesn't even go into, like, the, some of the practices in Ferguson and other places. But obviously, I mean, it makes it impossible. Like, how, how would a – an officer be able to relate to someone that they've been basically victimizing with tickets for three years or lifetime. Um, so all, all these underlying issues, in a way, they all sort of point, they, they're like these huge neon arrows pointing back to we need real community policing. And so I've, I've, I've been really, um, it's, it's kind of, you know, in a weird way, it's kind of heartening to see that like so many of our problems and so many of these smaller detailed issues in our communities, they sort of point back to one big goal. We need to figure out how to get law enforcement to be more responsive to the community. I just gave you a really long answer on the second one. I think I might, do you want to move on to the next question? Maybe I feel like I used up my no, time. No, that's <laughs> fine. Would you say your name, please? My name is Barbara Harris. I know in California they contract with, with counseling services for different crimes of exactly the same kind, and the counseling service has a much lower rate of recidivism. One question, is that done in Texas? Second question, how has legalizing marijuana affected Colorado, Washington, and Oregon as far as their crime rate? Sure. Um, well, uh, okay, sorry. So say your first question again. I, uh, the, I got distracted by Colorado. <laughs> <laughs> that one's the fun one. I want to talk. <laughs> it's interesting okay. to talk about. Uh, they have counseling services in Colorado oh, counseling services. and gotcha. California. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, so that that has been a problem in Texas, but a far more uh, narrow problem. So we don't have the kind of big – I think California has a bro kind of a broad widespread. I'm not an expert on this, but I think that they, they do have a bigger issue with us. Our, the only problems we've had, from what I understand, is some of the uh, our sex offenders, particularly youth that maybe were kind of caught up in the Romeo and Juliet. Anyway, I don't want to launch into the whole thing, but there's been some counselors that are required by courts and in the context of people with, with sex offenses – that they just don't they're they're like made up courses that aren't evidence based and so that's where we've seen that and that those reforms are sort of slow to come but I think they'll actually be here I mean it thankfully in Texas you know one of the strengths I think of having a legislature and agencies that are kind of composed of a lot of people that had lives in business at some point is that like when the metrics start not working people start <laughs> pulling the plug on stuff and so I think we've seen to some degree that's been a pretty effective argument for good public policy is to say look you know these these counseling programs aren't working. Um, so uh, your question, the other question was about marijuana legalization. So, yeah, I mean, what, what we've seen so far, it, it's sort of hard to, I mean, the impacts of these kind of policies you don't know for a while. So I would def definitely say, like, I don't want to be on the hook for this. Is like, this is what it'll be like. I can't predict the future exactly. But um, but we've seen, you know, there's no, there's no bump in crime. There hasn't been any rise in crime. There's, it's kind of hard to say that there's been a reduction in crime either. It's, again, kind of a short time span, we've seen that the, the states made a lot of money off of it. In, in the effect, in, in Colorado, the, um, I think the states having to figure out what to do with the money. They've found, gotten so much more. And, and that's actually, you know, that's actually exactly where I would like to plug into this and, and just respond to a question you didn't ask. Um, the, uh, the money that's coming out of it, Colorado really raises some questions about, I mean, like if we could raise that kind of money in Texas, we could put ACs in all our prisons, you know? Like there's some stuff we could do with this. Like I I, I, the other thing I think of, and, and I, I don't have any 
I don't know if this is a one-to-one relationship, but it, let's, I wish it was. Um, we, ACLU went and toured with some other groups from Texas and some Houston Police Department folks and others, the, a program in Seattle called the Law Enforcement uh, Assisted Diversion Program. And uh, it was actually instituted prior to marijuana being legalized there, but it was basically the uh, Belltown, this one part of uh, about a square mile of Seattle had like 90% of the possession, you know, hard, hard drug arrests in the city. And so instead of like making it a war zone because people wanted to live there and they thought it would be um, nice that basically all these tech millionaires were moving into Belltown, they were moving from California to Seattle not realizing that they were moving into, like like I said, where 90% of the possession arrests happened in the whole city. Um, that's a made-up statistic. I should be clear. I don't know the exact statistic, but it was a lot. Um, so anyway, long and short of it is that law enforcement has been freed from worrying about marijuana busts, and so they have more time to sit down and to coordinate with people's probation officers, to go out and to meet with people that have been arrested 25 times for possession because they're you know, in some kind of cycle of drug use and mental health issues. And so... Washington is really like they've been able to go and put officers into these specialized programs that really address some issues that need to be addressed. I mean, homelessness isn't going to be uh, – we can't arrest our way out of homelessness. and um, But we can have programs like LEAD that do start to address that. And I think personally getting these officers to quit focusing on marijuana – possession marijuana enforcement in downtown Seattle, I mean, that just gives you extra folks to go and work with programs that actually work. So anyway – I wish that's where we would head with it. We'll see where it goes. We have a question here. Yeah. Tim, would you stand and say your full name? Hi, uh, Tim Pittman. Um, nice to have you here. And you. I was wondering about your sort of uncensored view uh, to as much as possible on uh, prosecutorial misconduct. Sure. And the reason I say uncensored is because I, I, I would just assume that since you work with the law enforcement community a lot, you have to – it's a – a little bit of a sensitive, you don't want to come across as anti-prosecutor or anti-cop or anything like that. And, you know, I might yeah. mention it in like the Michael Morton case, for example, because it had such high profile and actually wound up with somebody spending it like a night in prison for being a bad prosecutor, which mm-hmm. is like the first time ever. Um, well, I, this is sort of a running joke in my family. My brother's a prosecutor, and so there's kind of a running joke that I have much more balanced uh, take on prosecutors than you would imagine. Um but I think it's still sort of uncensored. I mean, you know, Michael Morton, it, what you, what I think we don't want in our in our society, just the biggest possible picture, is we want to be able to trust prosecutors, and um, we don't want a very small number of people abusing that authority to make everybody think all prosecutors are terrible, right? And the Michael Morton case, probably, I mean, above any other, has made, I mean, it's it's a black eye for prosecutors in Texas. I mean, it was a real debacle. It was a guy that did not commit this crime, and I mean, he went all the way through, and you know, it's hard not to um, have kind of an emotional response to this stuff. I mean, I've, you know, I've met, we, Dick and I both met Anthony Graves, who was on Texas Death Row, and he's the nicest, I mean, it's kind of unreal to meet him. He's very nice and less damaged than you would imagine, frankly. So, it's hard not to take it personally that prosecutors wrongfully push the envelope and try to get people arrested, but or try to get people put in, in, in prison, but, you know, when you look through, you know, I, I've been listening to the Serial podcast, so those of you who listen to that, you know, when you when you really delve into the facts of any one wrongful conviction, there's a lot of things go wrong. You know, the judge fails, the prosecutor fails. I think what we need is a is a package of reforms to address the prosecutorial misconduct. We need better accountability for prosecutors that do the wrong thing. I mean, I, I think that that's just clear. I think we definitely do. But I think we also need judges and others to be able to take a step back and just is is justice being done? You know, um, I'm going to use the serial example just because I don't want to talk about real cases other than the one that's in the media. But you know, the, in the case in serial, this the law enforcement uses cell phone data that they themselves don't understand to convict this kid of of murder, and he's probably not guilty. Um, you know, a prosecutor that does that, that prosecutor is still in office in Baltimore. You know, I mean, that guy is still involved um, in the criminal justice system. So. You know, that's the kind of – we can't let that keep happening. And, and I think it's not – the injustices need to stop. But it's also – we just have to have faith. And, you know, this – in a lot of ways, Black Lives Matter is about everyone losing faith in law enforcement's ability to be doing the right thing. We're worried about them. We don't need to go down the same road with prosecutors, too. We can figure out ways to ensure accountability. And ultimately, I mean um, – 
you know, this is the part, I guess, where you, when you have a brother who's a prosecutor, I mean, a lot of the people he puts in jail and prison, I mean, you're like, well, yeah, that, I mean, that makes sense. That person did something terrible. Um, so they, we should be able to hold them up as, as, as community leaders and, and people that help keep us safe. And we shouldn't uh, have to have these conversations over and over again about misconduct. But right now, misconduct keeps happening and it keeps being made public. Would you stand and say your name, please? Hi, I'm Chloe Sykes. Thanks, Matt, for being here. Yeah. Um, you mentioned at the, at the statewide level, and you talked about how criminal justice just it permeates every other facet of life. Um, going, looking ahead to 2017, what do you foresee as being some of the rising issues within criminal justice at the state level for that legislative session? Sure. Um, well, I think, so right now, 17-year-olds uh, are treated like adults in our criminal justice system. Uh, this is a pretty bad policy in terms of it doesn't have very good outcomes for, for youth. So uh, I think this will be the year that the state, or the, the session that the state moves it up to 18, kind of gets us in line with other states. Um, the big benefit being there that, that the kids that are 17 that would have been treated as adults before are actually placed in the juvenile justice system where there's a little bit better services and, and diversion op opportunities. Um, I think we'll also see a, a big conversation about sentencing. Um, there's been various folks indicate that there need to be some reforms to how long uh, people are put in jail for, in prison. Um, we'll see kind of what form that takes. Uh, I think in response to the Sandra Bland incident in, in Waller County, um, we'll see some major reforms to the county jails, particularly when it comes to suicide prevention. Um, those are actually to some degree are already in the works, but we'll see more. Um, and then, you know, I think we may see reforms to the driver's responsibility program. That's a uh, basically, well, I almost said it's an unconstitutional, in my opinion, it's an unconstitutional <laughs> program. No, it's a it's a set of fines and fees over and above your, your driving fees that the state of Texas uses to fund trauma care in hospitals, but it results in a lot of people that are poor not having their driver's license, and so it, it creates all kinds of problems. Um, so I think we'll start seeing some of those changes. I know that's kind of in the weeds, but <laughs> I think the big, you know, the big, the big picture will be we'll be talking about sentencing, we'll be talking about mental health, we'll be talking about um, maybe debtors' prisons, hopefully, like incarcerating people who have no money. We have about ten minutes left. Um, we have a question from Kenneth Coyne. Uh, Mr. Simpson, um, would you comment on on the El uh, El Chapo? Uh, please, what is of interest is this man has a good side. Uh, it's not talked about, and you're the first one that I'm asking. Uh, what is the effect of having a pharmacy nationwide? that also tr helps treat the poor. And secondly, the world's best health insurance is offered by El Chapo. Second, Second is, would you recommend that the public help uh, write presidential pardon request for, uh, for instance, Leslie, who is, uh, was 19, and now it's 38, and nobody's there. Well, I don't. Um, I guess you know I don't. I don't know how much I can really talk about El Chapo. I mean, I don't. I don't know. I heard the hardly an area of, ex of expertise for me. Um, I will say I think that it's sort of interesting. You know, there, there's a lot of focus on the, the the danger of the cartels just on the other side of the Texas border, and. Um, I always think it's interesting, you know, I mean, basically every academic and everybody that researches this says, well, you know, if, if the U.S. could figure out how to either reduce our intake of drugs or to uh, legalize drugs, then these cartels would actually kind of go out of business overnight. Um, you know, it starts to give a whole new, it gives a completely different tenor and one that doesn't really happen much in the context of our national and state media. I mean, the, you know, there is a question of whether the United States is actually propping up these cartels in, in like El Chapo. I mean, if you think he's bad you know, maybe we should think about what we do about the war on drugs because it's they're, they're very much kind of part of that package. Um, so I think that's as close as I'm going to get to being able to answer. I'm not sure. But then um, when it comes to uh, writing the president, I think, you know, we've seen a real push at the national level as well. I mean, I've, I've talked mostly about what's been happening in Texas, but at the national level, we're seeing the same instinct. You know, people that were I, you, you probably everybody's hearing the term mandatory minimum for the first time ever in the mainstream media. Right. Like a mandatory minimum means that you don't get out early no matter what. And so it 
really means that people don't have the capacity. It doesn't give the, the criminal justice system the ability to remove people from incarceration if they improve, if their behavior changes, if they become a different person or, if, you know, for whatever reason. And so, um, you know, I think actually now is a great time to, to, to get involved with um, – contacting federal authorities. I mean, you know, there were a bunch of people released from federal prisons that were there on mandatory minimum possession charges. And I think there's an opportunity also to jump on some of the Supreme Court uh, rulings on age and, and try to get some of these folks that were given life uh, without parole an opportunity to go on parole, which I think is maybe what you were referring to. So there's been a kind of a, you know, again, it's really interesting. Criminal justice right now in the United States, there's a lot happening. There's a lot of, like, moving parts and um, it's kind of inspiring or exciting to watch. You know, even you know, even just a few years ago, the Supreme Court finally weighed in and said, you know, you can't put youth in in prison for life for any. You know, you have to give them some opportunity, even if it's after 40 years. You have to at least give them some opportunity to go on parole. Um, and so there's an opportunity, I think, at the federal level to address some of these. The federal level really had an even more extreme sentencing problem than probably Texas does, although. They're both not great. So, go ahead. We have a question from Tomas Rodriguez. Uh, thank you for being here, and thanks for having ACLU. Uh, question is, um, was it plea bargaining? Where does that enter into our prison business? Yeah. Um, so there's a, there's a real problem with plea bargaining. Um, you know, I think one of the things is there's just not a, a broad understanding of how that works. You know, um, something like 85% plus of cases end up being pled out instead of going to court, and it may be higher than that. Um, and so a lot of people don't realize that. And so what that means is that, you know, you sometimes um, an individual defendant will be intimidated by the threat of going, to, going in front of a jury or a judge with the potential of a life or multiple life um, sentences. And so sometimes people uh, will just plead and, and – you literally, I mean, I think there's about 30 innocence cases in Texas, and about three to four of them where folks actually pled guilty, and then they were like DNA proven to be not guilty. So, you know, to me, I guess I don't, I don't need any more evidence than that. Although there is plenty more evidence um, that the, the plea bargaining system isn't working right. And, um, you know, to me, I mean, it, there's a lot of different ways. There's, there's a lot of stuff we need to do. I, I, it's almost like an, it's another hour conversation just to talk about fixing it. But to me, one of the things that would make a lot of sense is that a judge has to ask the person, are you actually guilty? You know, I mean, I think very often the judge will explain a plea bargain to the person that's considering it, and they'll say, you know, if you accept this, you'll have, you know, a minimum of five years, you'll be eligible for probation or pro parole, et cetera. But they never say, if you're innocent, this is a really terrible, you know, this is a bad idea because it's going to be really hard to undo this. And, um, and so there's other – there's things, you know, I think we kind of – like a lot of criminal justice issues, you know, you have everything from like really kind of what sound like basic notice almost provisions, like, you know, just let people know they have rights, all the way through like completely rethinking – I mean, maybe there's charges that no one should be able to plea to. You know, maybe we need to just rethink the entire process. And we wouldn't have to do it for everything. I mean, plea bargains are part of how our court system works, for better or for worse at this point. Um, you can't just reformat the whole thing. But – you know, what if you couldn't plead a murder? I mean, what would that even mean? You know, it would be very interesting to everything had to go to, to, to final conviction for any murder. So anyway, there could be other options to change it. We're, we have five minutes left, okay. and we have a question from Larry Quartz, who's Great. been a wonderful member of our forum committee for a long time. My question, my question regards the prison industry and the for-profit nature of the prison industry, you know, people in important places that want to see the prison industry can continue. Mm -hmm. How do you continue your program in the face of the people that want to see the, the uh, privatization of the prison industry grow? Well, I, I, so I touched on it a little bit before, but, uh, you know, the um, in Texas and in, particularly in my experience, you know, the, the majority of um, – the facilities really aren't private. Um, there's, there's not an issue. The, the, the real issues with the immigration facilities, those are, the, those are the ones that are private, and that's where we really see this kind of um, uh, this big money push to put more people into um, into some kind of incarceration facility. Um, the you know the approach to addressing that is actually uh, uh, pretty complicated. You know, I think that you, you know 
in some ways you can't address a problem or you can't help people, you know, make recommendations to address something if people don't realize it's a problem. And so in a lot of ways, I think we in the United States are still on the kind of beginning to understand the large num network of immigration detention, privately run facilities that are out there and run poorly. Um, I, I mentioned it before, but the ACLU has a report called Warehoused and Forgotten on some of these facilities. And, um, you know, it contains a lot of recommendations, but I mean, it, the basics, you know, it, it is a real problem um, and having to fight the influence of money kind of in D.C. on these issues is actually a huge – it's a huge part of why this continues to persist as a problem when, you know, you, you kind of see a different – you know, you you almost have like a test case where you have like the federal issues and, and money is definitely involved with these different GEO and CCA and these other prison companies. They're dumping money into stuff. And then in Texas, you know, you really – you don't have the money being dumped into it and you see that there's – the state's moving away from, you know, basically privatized facilities. And so – um, I think in a way, Texas provides like a, a, a point counterpoint to the federal experience in the way that we've seen these private immigration facilities everywhere. And I think awareness is really the first step, and there's a lot beyond that. So. I'm going to get in one quick question. Sure. We're close to the end. You mentioned that um, there is closer scrutiny of the treatment programs for various offenders. I, I hope that that's the case. And for example, taking a look at the empirical effectiveness of the sex offender treatment programs, and I would say substance abuse and neglect uh, and abuse and dependence as well, because these things can spring up. Uh, some groups are profiteering off these treatment programs, and they may not necessarily be operating out of a scientific research base. So do you actually see that, that it, there's some green shoots there? Yeah. I mean, I think, you know, I think that there – I think that the, the legislature and the state agencies that oversee are, are starting to be very aware that these programs have to be evidence-based. They have to show statistical success, um, or really people aren't going to support them any further in the future. And so um, – it's it's a new way of thinking though for some people, and so this is not this is we are in the midst of changing over to Moneyball from whatever our previous way of thinking was. Um, but I don't think we're quite there yet. But I think we're getting there. We're getting there. Well, that's that's really good news, yeah. and we want to thank you for a leading edge presentation on yeah. criminal justice issues. Let's give him a really big hand. Thank you, Matt Simpson.